Well, a paper, this is an unfettered delight for me to catch up with you again. It's so good to see you, Craig. When you called, when you sent me the email, I was so excited because we had such a great chat the last time we connected. Well, I have to say, you are such bona fide law and order royalty. I really feel as though I should be genuflecting right now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now, that theme song, a paper, da, 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 it's such an icon, isn't it? And Mike Post, of course, composed that. Yeah. And when you think of all of the great stuff he's done over the years, like the Rockford Files and Magnum PI and I think Hill Street Blues and the A-Team, and I think he even produced a Kenny Rogers album or two. You know, when I first heard about the show, I was on Broadway at the time doing August Wilson's The Piano Lesson. Yes. And I got this audition and I was sitting with our um our manager at the time, our production manager, and she would come into my dressing room and we'd talk about things that were happening. Yeah. And I said, I've got an audition for this thing called Law and Order. And she went, oh, right, you're in the theater. I'll get you a tape. So the next day she brought me a VHS tape because that's how long ago it was. And the first thing that I recall hearing was, Boom, 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 boom. And I was like, wow, this music is so cool. And then proceeded to see this incredible episode. And of course, you were a huge fan of that show, weren't you? Um, yeah. For a long time before you joined the series, actually. Yeah. And the thing that was so cool is because my character was supporting yes. and she usually showed up at the beginning, the first half of the show. Yes. When I first started, I didn't read the end of the scripts <laughs> because I still wanted to be, uh, you know, a, a, a fan of the show. Yes. And then one day, one of the directors said, you know, with this scene coming up in the second half, it's and he started talking. I went, well, well wait a minute. And, and I told him what I'd been doing. He said, Look, sometimes you're going to end up in the back half of the show. Read the scripts. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm guessing you probably wanted to be at home watching it like the rest of the world and see how the storyline unfurled in all its drama. Totally, totally. But eventually that became very difficult. But I did it for a, about a year. I yeah. wouldn't read the second half of the show so I could sit down and go, oh, my gosh, that's the way it ended, ah, you know, like a fan. Let's pop you into the TARDIS and whirl back to 1986. And your first TV gig was with the wonderful Paul Rubens in Pee Wee's Playhouse. Is that right? Yes, it was. And, you know, I went to the audition for it. And the first time I auditioned, it was just a young woman yes. who really didn't have a sense of humor. And, and then I heard nothing. And maybe two weeks later, I heard they had different casting people. And when I went in, there was the producer, the director, this guy named Paul Rubens, and there was someone else, the reader. And this person, Paul, had long hair and a goatee. He looked like a 60s reject. Yes. And I find out this is Pee Wee because I had not seen the show. Uh -huh. And I think he figured that out <laughs> once he realized that I had did not know who the character was. And, you know, that's my fault as an actor, not going prepared. Uh, but I was on my way to the theater when I stopped for this audition. And he, I think he figured it out and he made fun of me that entire audition. <laughs> and, and we just had such a rapport from the beginning. And when I finally got to set and he walked on set, my nephew, it was my nephew who told me who Pee Wee Herman was. So I got a chance to see the big adventure before I started the gig, but he knew, and to this day, Paul Rubens is one of the few people that can make me laugh at any moment. You, of course, played Reba, the very chirpy male lady. Was that a fun role to play? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I mean, I was just talking about it the other day because when we first started, 
uh, you know, you'd walk on set and there would, there would be something different every day. So one day I said to Paul, can you like, let me come in early? Cause now the show's in LA just so I can hang out on set. And he said, sure. So every time I'd work, he'd bring me in two days early so I could just walk around the set. And the 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 people, who, the crew, the props people, uh, all of these people were extraordinary artisans. So every time you walked on the set, there was something different to see. I, yeah. I loved it. I loved it. And for that to be my first job, it, it still is the most memorable for me. And a pay for the thing is there are a lot of people who pass through that show. I mean, you think about it, you've done a recent episode, Poker Face, with the wonderful Natasha Leone. She reminded you that she <laughs> was on that show back in, in the 80s. She walks into the makeup room my first day, the makeup trailer, and yeah. she points to me and she goes, Pee Wee's Playhouse. And I'm like, oh, yes, yeah, she liked Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yes. And about two days later, I hear from Paul. Yes. yes. And he goes, you're working with Natasha. I heard you're working with Natasha. I said, yeah. And he goes, you don't remember her. And I, I'm like, what do you mean? He sent me this picture. She was like five or seven years old. You know, you have to be nice to everybody because look, these years later, she's producing this incredible yes. show that I have the opportunity to do a poker face amazing now tell me is this right because i have a vague recollection of the great lawrence fishburne playing cowboy curtis uh in in, in that show lawrence fishburne jimmy smits was the yes. was the mechanic on the show i mean a lot of people came through the show and the thing is you have remained such great friends with Paul Rubin. We see him on television, in the movies. He is just so wonderfully funny. Is he very much like that in person, away from the cameras? He is indeed. He's a, he's a little more subdued, but, mm. but what you see in, in Pee Wee, it, that all comes from Paul. He, yes. he really is funny. And to this day, you know, when he calls me, he always uses a different voice. <laughs> and I always, I always know it's him. <laughs> and I always crack up. Uh, and whenever we can, we try to see one another, you know, but he's on one coast, I'm on the other. Yes. But we have stayed like very good friends in all these years. And he is indeed a very funny person. Well, very it was that show that really, I suppose, launched your career and into the movies. Do you remember your first movie role? Well, my first movie role was with um, Spike Lee, She's Gotta Have It. That was where I played the psychiatrist, the therapist. He's got such gravitas now, the great Spike Lee. What are your memories of working with him on that movie? Well, you know, it was done on shoestring. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's like doing, uh, well, I call it guerrilla theater, not meaning it's rough, or, but, but that, you know, he was so... He was so excited about yeah. it. And, and he brought that to, to our rehearsals and to our shoot. Um, and that's what I remember the most. Uh, and, and I only worked with the, with the young woman who, who and my, you know, I'm so old now, I can't always remember names, Tracy. Um, but I, she was the only person that I worked with on the film. So once I saw it and I saw all these people that I knew, it was kind of cool. It was really cool. Navy Seals with Charlie Sheen. That was another of your early movie roles. Was the Charlie that you knew and worked with back then the kind of slightly crazy Charlie Sheen that we know now? Or did, ha did he have a whole different attitude back then? Well, I say he had a different attitude mm. uh, you know i was that it's a different person that eventually you know was charlie sheen but then you know there were antics because it was mostly a bunch of guys yes um, yeah it was a real easy kind of shoot for me as well and it was the first time i'd done a big movie you know big 
uh, a studio movie. So it was fun. And I got to know Dennis Her Haysbert on oh, that dude. film. Yeah, so it was great. It was cool. Another beauty for you, uh, Random Hearts, of course, with, with Harrison Ford. Now, we know that he's got this kind of gruff exterior, but surely behind the scenes, I believe he has a wit that is drier than the driest martini and this wonderful sense of humour. Well, he definitely has a sense of humour. Yes. Uh, because that part, I kept uh, turning some words around and and... And I was supposed to say, you know, you're 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 a good guy, and and I was so happy that I finally gotten the words right that I said, you know, you're a good girl, and we just started <laughs> laughing, and then I don't know, two or three years later, I saw him <laughs> at a award show in in uh, L.A. and I walked up to him and I said, I don't know if you remember me. And he went, oh, no, I remember you. And it was so sweet, but he really did remember. It was good. So he was just lovely to me. He really was. I saw you in a movie not long ago. I know it was, you know, back in the in those incredible heady days of, of Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez the first time around. So that's like, you know, the uh, the 2000s, 2004, I think. Jersey Girl. I mean, uh, what right. is this where you wound up spending so much of your time? Between um, Jennifer Lopez's legs. Nothing gets more personal or intimate than that, does it? Hello. Pain? Hello. It doesn't. And... <laughs> And, and I remember looking at the film and I thought, wow, you know, if someone asks you, how was that film? Hmm. What do you say? You know, I spent all of the time in between her legs and then the character dies. You know, I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. But it was working with, with Kevin Smith yes. was really the highlight of it. You know, yeah. what a great guy. He was a huge Law & Order fan, too. So we had to talk about Law & Order, uh, 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 you know, during that time. But, yeah, that was that was great fun. And Ben and Jennifer were lovely. You know, it was the beginning of that whole Benifer thing. But the two of them couldn't have been sweeter. A lot of fans loved you in Terminator 2 Judgment Day with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. That must have been kind of surreal. It truly was because, again, it was like the first time I'd ever done such a big blockbuster. Yes. But I'll tell you my most favorite moment. It, it was a, a moment when all the characters are getting the information about who and what he is. Yes. And yes. we were taking a break between shots and uh, Eddie Furlong was giving him tongue twisters yes and i turned to him and i said new unique new york yeah. unique new york and you know he tried to say it and couldn't and then we sh we're shooting and you know there's there's gunfire and things are being thrown and and you know people are falling and there are stunts and jim says at one point you know stop stop cut and there's this silence. And in the background, I heard, no, 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 He was still trying to say it. It was the best thing. After all of this noise, he was still trying to say unique New York. It was hilarious. Oh, <laughs> have you run into him over the years since? I wonder. I actually, I actually have. It was an NBC event, and I think he was coming on to NBC with something. And I went over to say hello, and he remembered me, and he gave me a great big hug. It was really cool. It was really. It, I'm always surprised. I don't know why. I'm always surprised when folks remember. You know what I mean? because I had such a little part in it but in terms of of the time that we spent together it was a it was a very important part in the film so that's probably why I wonder if he's mastered unique New York New York <laughs> you you can say it slowly but the point is saying it fast unique New York unique New York 1993, I'm sure, is a year for you that means an awful lot because along comes Law and Order. You become essentially a legend and a stalwart as Anita Van Buren. 
Is it true that it was your willingness to, to wear a wig that essentially kind of clinched the deal for you because it just gave Van Buren that kind of conservative edge that was required. Well, back then there was, a, you know, it was, cons you know, there were t times where it, the studios would say, you know, she needs a different look or, yeah. uh, you, you know, she's worn the Afro too much. And, and I said to Dick, cause he called me in, I had done an, uh, uh, an episode in the very first season of the show. And when he called me in for this, I said, but her hair wouldn't be natural. You know, she she would have a coif. Mm -hmm. So I, I let, I'm going to take my hair, my own hair, I'm going to brush it down and put it in a bun and I'll come and see you. And he said, when he saw me, he was like, that's the look, that's it. And I always say that there are two reasons why I got the job. The first was that I was willing to wear the wig and I, and it was really my choice. But mm -hmm. the second thing is, is that his daughters uh, were uh, Serena and Olivia were huge Law and Order fans. And I mean, I'm sorry, Pee Wee's Playhouse fans. Yes. And when they found out that I was, he was looking at me for the part he told he tells me that and he laughs about it to this day that I got the job because of Serena and Olivia. So yes. I always thank them whenever I have the opportunity because of them. I did 17 seasons on that show. Oh, they, loved, they loved Pee Wee's Playhouse. A so, lot of people did all over the world. It's funny you you talk about that show now, and there's so many fond memories about it. It's it's funny the characters and the shows that stick in people's minds, isn't it? it it's true, and it was such an innovative show at the time, and I think that's and it and it it was it it sort of had a cross between being for adults and for children because yes. the parents could sit and watch the kids, and there were some things the kids didn't get that were specifically focused for the parents. So it became a, an opportunity for a family on Saturday morning to yeah. have breakfast and watch Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah. You know, because some of the things had a little double entendre to them, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? And so the parents would get a hoot out of that and the kids wouldn't know what it was about. <laughs> yes, that was the exactly. cleverness though of, of Paul Rubens thinking about it. Speaking of clever too, I mean, the great Dick Wolf, I mean, what, an, what a legend. You and Jill Hennessy started on that show essentially around the same time. And a lot of critics have pointed this out, Apatha, that you and Jill essentially kind of saved that show because up until then, it was really considered one of those testosterone heavy shows. You come in and it gives it a whole new lease on life. That's right, isn't it? And I, it was an edict that was actually passed down by NBC to Dick mm -hmm. that they needed to bring some women onto the show. And and literally that's how it happened. And, and the fact that I had done that one episode in the very first season of the show put me on his radar. Yes. And, and so, you know, and, and it really did change the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it ended up 20 seasons. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because it had a different perspective. It wasn't so heavy in testosterone. It brought in uh, the opportunity to see not only a woman in a, in a position of authority, but a woman who could go and win cases. So it was a very different way to see women uh, on television as late as, you know, the 19, early 1990s. For you, as you mentioned, 17 seasons, I think something like over 390 episodes. You obviously loved that role. You loved I working. did. I did because I thought she was very, the character was very smart. Yes. I thought she, she knew her business, but I also felt like she had a heart uh, and she was indeed, you know, very much a, a woman, but a woman in a position of authority, which, which I really, really did love. I loved the character. I was, she's still one of my favorite characters, Anita okay. Van Buren. You know, they say the secret to Law and Order um, was the brilliant writing, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt. But also the other thing was the tremendous chemistry of 
the actors. And you have to say, you know, there was some brilliance in the casting of that because everybody was so impeccably chosen. Would you say it was like a family to work on? Did you really get that lovely cohesive vibe? Listen, I am due to call Jesse Martin back when we finish this. Yes. Uh, I, I still stay in touch with uh, Jill. Uh, I stay in touch with Angie, not as often as with Jill. Uh, I stay in touch with Ben. You know, you spend 17 years with people. You see the, the, the death of parents and the birth of children and children graduating high school and college. I mean, that 17 years is a long span of life. And, and so you end up seeing these things and losing colleagues, losing Jerry. Uh, and losing Dennis, Farina. I mean, those are those are the things that uh, you know make you family. And and I still have the fondest memory of the last conversation I had with Dennis Farina, who is one of my all time favorite people. I was in Italy, and 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 you know he's Italian, and he was like, oh my goodness, this is where you need to go. You need to see this. You need to go here. Just, you know, just a great, great guy. And uh, so, yeah, you you do learn to to love these folks that you're working with. And, and you know, it'd be difficult if you didn't. Oh, totally. Tell me about <laughs> the great Jerry, Jerry Orbach. You know, I mean, like your Anita, his Lenny Briscoe was an absolute fan favorite. Iconic, there was iconic. Dream to me that you two got on so well. We we did. And the thing that was so cool about that particular iteration of the show, meaning uh, Jerry Orbach and Jesse Martin, was that they were both Broadway babies. Yes. And, and so there would be all kinds of singing on the set, which is what I really loved. So yeah. I could join in with them. But yeah, it was a great set. And what a lot of people don't know is that all of those one liners that Jerry had, those were all from him. That, that wasn't anything that was written. And he was amazing with with things like that and a great storyteller and and really, really good at telling jokes. Oh, yes. His sense of humor just absolutely sparkled. He had a wit so dry, serious, it was almost a sawdust. But I mean, what must it have been like, though, a paper sitting with him at lunch or going to dinner or something like that, hanging with him and talking about those great days of Broadway? That was what I loved about him as well. You know, in the very early days of the show, me and, and Jesse, well, this was Ben, Ben Bratt, the three of us would go to lunch. Yes. And, you know, first of all, what I would love is, the fact that while we're eating, people would walk up to him. Because in New York, Jerry Orbach was loved. And people would walk up to him in the middle of a fork going into his mouth. He would put the fork down and speak to them, sign an autograph. And I said, Jerry, you're having dinner. You can't tell them to wait. And he goes, kid, always know. These are the people that keep you working. These are your fans. Give them a minute. You can give them a minute. And I, I've always remembered that. Always. It happened to me today at lunch that someone stopped and I was like this. And I got up and took a picture with them. And those are the things that I learned from being around the pros. Oh, those yeah. Are the things you learn. And they didn't come much more professional or more legendary, certainly in New York, than Jerry Orbach. Look, what fans didn't know of Pather is that he had been secretly ill uh, and yeah. with cancer for years, but he continued to do law and order. Working was his life. He just loved it, ever the trooper. When did you find out that he wasn't well? When he said he was leaving. Because I, he would have never left the show. He loved it. He mm. loves doing the show. He loves New York. And mm. so it allowed him to stay at home. And I think that's what all of us, how all of us felt. But when he's, and I remember him telling us uh, 10 years before he passed that, you know, he had the cancer. And 
and that he was fighting it. And he did. Uh, and when he told us he was leaving, I knew that he was very ill. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of the three of us, of Jesse, Jerry, and I in the precinct. And he's got his arms around both of us with this big smile on his face. And my head is down. And Jesse has this look of anguish on his face because I just said to Jesse, he's really ill. And, and he said, yeah, because he would never leave this show. He would never leave it. And that's when, that's when I knew. And yeah. it was only 69 when he passed, and that was 2004, uh, almost 20 years ago. Wow. Wow. I'm just wondering, Apatha, do you ever feel him around you? Are there moments where you think, oh, my gosh, that was like a Jerry moment? Or, for instance, today at lunch and somebody came up and your fork is about to go there and you're thinking, I'm going to stand up and take a picture. Did you feel Jerry was maybe there just saying, now, listen, to pay for I, I don't I know. To... I don't know if, if, if I had that feeling, but I know that where it comes from. I know that it was a lesson that I learned, and that lesson came from Jerry. So I don't know if I necessarily feel the spirit. And every now and then I'll watch an old episode and and I'm I'm I always have to giggle because there are one liners in the show <laughs> that the writers never thought of. But but Jerry, I mean, he he had those things at his fingertips. He was just really a lovely, lovely man. And I remember one day we ended up riding uptown together and they rarely do that, put actors in the same car. Uh, but it was a busy day. And so they asked if we mind sharing a car. And I was like, no. So I said something to him about one of the one liners. He said, I said, Jerry, I'm so bad at jokes. And he went, kid, it's not hard. And I said, Jerry, trust me. He gave me three jokes. Each one had two lines. He made me repeat it four times, three jokes, two lines a piece. I repeated them four times. The next day I go into work. He goes, kid, first joke. Epatha, the first joke. I said, Jerry, you're gonna be so mad at me. I, I, I remember the first lines, but I don't remember the, the punchline. And he went, two lines, you only had two lines each. He, he got so mad. He said, I'll never tell you another joke. Never. He goes, I'll never do that. And I said, Jerry, I tried to tell you for some reason I have a block on jokes. He could not believe it. I could not, Craig, for the life of me, remember the punchline. And literally, it was just two lines. To this day, I wish I had written them down. <laughs> to this day. He was so mad and I, and I kept laughing. I was like, Jerry, I'm sorry. And he would look at me some, you know, that day we'd do something and, you know, he'd be somewhere on the set and he'd look over at me and he'd go like this, two lines, two lines. <laughs> you know, Apathy, you're blessed, aren't you, in many ways that you can turn on the, the, the television and an old episode will come up and you'll see Jerry and it only brings a big smile to your face. You laugh thinking of his antics and the wonderful times you shared rather than really feeling sad. You know, it's nice, isn't it, to see the kind of the good things rather than thinking, oh, no, he's not here because he'll always be here in some way. Yeah, and, and, you know, life changes and, you know, you do new things, you meet new people. But, you know, those memories are the ones that that's what's going to hold yes. for for me, the the things that I remember, the people that I met. And, and you know, there were a lot of people who came through Law and Order. I mean, there used to be a time where you went to Broadway in New York, and if somebody didn't have a Law and Order credit, you wondered, did they just get off the boat or how bad are they? <laughs> because everybody did a Law and Order. Everybody. It was the only game in town for a long time. And so many people came through, and I got to meet so many great 
so many great people do, doing the show. You and Benjamin yeah. Bratt became very close friends too. What was he like to work with? He's like my little brother. Je Je Jesse and, and Benjamin Bratt are like my little brothers. And Benjamin, the only thing that you could say about him is he's such a loving person. He's a decent person. He's he's a, a, a huge family man. Um, and and just just really really good people and every now and then we'll pop each other and just to say hello thinking about you love you and every birthday we we text every birthday and he's just really a, a decent mm -hmm. decent man and and i i absolutely adore him Sam Waterston, do you have uh, great memories of working with him? Another one Absolutely. of another the backbone of that show too, like you and and Jerry. Absolutely, and you know, just recently we did something at, for the uh, NBC. Uh, what do they call them? Upfronts, where yes. they introduce all the shows, and we did it last year. I wasn't able to do it this year. But we did it last year, and and there was Sam and I. You know, he's he's going back to, you know, going back to the show, and it was just really lovely to see him and his wife Lynn, who's just the sweetest person in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it's great when you do these things, and and I was only there a year before Sam came on the show. He and I were the two longest running characters on the show and you know we just really have great memories of working together and and i'm not saying it was all you know sugar sweet you know there were hard times there were difficulties and you know trying to get the stories out and one of the things that i really do appreciate about my presence on the show is that you know we did we did readings and we sat because the shows was separated, but the cops would read one, uh, you know, one episode and uh, I mean the one, the same episode and the and the lawyers would sit with the writers and, and discuss. So my voice is a part of that show, the making of the show. They gave us that opportunity and and it doesn't always happen um, and it wasn't always uh, uh, welcomed by some of the writers. I mean, sure, they're sitting down and you're telling them you don't like what they wrote, but but it was respected. Yes. And and, and I do feel that my voice is very much a part of of the success of Law and Order, all of our voices, I'm not saying me. Uh, alone, but all of our voices because we sat and they heard us. The writers heard what we said, and and I so so appreciated that. So after seventeen seasons, which is a marathon run, <laughs> over three hundred and ninety episodes, um, Anita turns her badge in. Was that a difficult decision for you to make? And and why did you decide it was kind of time to maybe do something else? Well, you you know, I, I had done pretty much all that I could. Mm -hmm. And 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 that last season of Law and Order was a, a, an amazing story arc for yes. Vic Buren. And 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 it ended on a very positive note. And so it just seemed like a, a, the perfect time for me to move on. Uh, and, you know, to this day, people recognize me for that role. And, and so I'm very proud of, of what I did, but it was time to go. Mm. It was time to go. Did Dick Wolf try to stop you? I mean, he's the father of law and order, and <laughs> in many respects, you were one of the, the really important hearts and soul of that incredible series. Did he say, no, Pathy, you can't go and throw him? He didn't want me to go. Him. He didn't want me to go. But I was like, Dick, you know, what else can I do here? You yeah. know, I've done, I've done so much here. And Look, I love that man. You know, he's kept me working now for almost 30 years. And it's a respect that he has for what I bring to the table. And, and you know, the one of the things I always say to anyone who's working with Dick, 
you know, he's loyal. You look at his shows and you see people coming back from different shows. Um, and that's not always a word you hear in Hollywood, loyalty. Oh. Oh. And, and Can't be spelt. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I, I love him for that. And, but, you know, he understood, he understood when I said, I just want to try some, some new things and I wanted to do more theater. Um, and I ended up, you know, making a documentary. So it was just, it was just really a lovely, it was a good time to leave. And, and I was happy that I did. And the only thing that I was sorry for is that the show was canceled after that. Yes, you know. it wasn't long after, was it, that the show ended? However, it was that season it ended that twentieth season. That's yeah. right. Certainly not your association with Dick Wolf, though, as you say, he's very loyal. But I mean, you were back, uh, you know, for the past eight years. Chicago Med, a great role there of uh, of Sharon Sharon Goodwin, who basically runs the hospital. All said and done, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and that happened so simply my manager called and he said oh i was just talking to peter jankowski who's one of our executive producers and i said tell him i want a job tell yeah. him i'm ready to work and he called me back in like an hour and he said peter wanted to know if you're serious and i was like what who's not serious about wanting to work <laughs> and that's how it happened it was wow. literally that that simple they were starting chicago med and there's a role for you so that's what I mean about here's a man who like now Dick has like nine shows on television, 11 if you call, count the two that are on the cable stations. Yes. And, you know, he he gave me this job because of our relationship and and it's always been a good relationship and I, I appreciate what he does. And of course, his work, Sharon, too, your character in Chicago Med, because she's done the crossover stuff. She's been in Chicago PD and, and Chicago Fire. So, you know, I tell you what, uh, she's kept very busy, isn't she? She is indeed. It, you know, it's a great, another great character. And, and what I, again, what I love about her is the fact that, you know, even though she's the boss, she yes. also, she also has a heart. Yes. So, but and but she doesn't take any stuff. No, I'm going to take you to 2005, Apatha, because this is just delicious. You know, there's nothing like award shows, and if something is going to go wrong, it'll maybe go wrong at an award show. So the Emmy Awards, uh, Best Actress for uh, <laughs> Lackawanna Blues, and your list of thank yous. Well, it it sailed down there, didn't it? It, it kind of went. Craig. You know where Craig. it went. Let me tell you the story. <laughs> I wanted to have something written just in case. Yes. And and I had never worn a strapless bra. And I had no idea that it would move like it moved. <laughs> and and it was literally I found it at the end of the night when I took off the gown, it was stuck to my stomach. <laughs> And let me just say that the that the uh, ink had smeared a bit, but <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I, I was so embarrassed. But when I look back on it now, all I do is laugh because it was it was a real moment. Oh, it a real, real moment. moment. Did you remember to thank everybody that was on that list that sailed? I think down I did. Yeah, I think I did. I think. <laughs> but that I wasn't the I end of your remarkable award acceptance speeches and so forth, because now let me take you to 2006. So it was the following year and we're talking the SAG Awards. Uh, and again, it was for uh, uh, Lackawanna Blues. And um, you cracked everybody up when out of the blue, off off of your lips sailed a big thank you to, of all people, your divorce lawyer. And let me tell you, I, I realized how lucky I had been that I had pretty much the opportunity to thank everyone. But this guy <laughs> actually, he saved me in so many ways. <laughs> and Sandy Ain. And Sandy Ain said he had, he didn't, he didn't know that that the uh, SAG awards were on, yeah. 
-hmm. but but that he said that next morning he got calls from all over about <laughs> Epatha Merkerson, S. Epatha Merkerson, uh, thanking you as his as her divorce lawyer. And he went, "Did you really do that?" I said, "Yes, yeah, Sandy, because you know you saved me a lot of money." And it really was like a last minute thought because. I, I kept trying to think of, okay, I'll, I'll thank my agent and, you know, Ruben Santiago Hudson, who wrote the play and George Wolf. I, I, I thanked all these people. And as I was walking up the stairs, cause it was Ben that said my name for the award on top of that, it was yeah. Benjamin Brett. And so that was just really wonderful. And, and Sandy Ames name came up immediately. I was like, you know, I've had the opportunity to thank everybody, but let me thank this guy. And I mean, I could look out in the house and everybody was like, they were laughing. It was great. It was, oh, great. It was a moment, you know, <laughs> thinking about the trajectory of your career and some of the really fabulous things you've done. There was a movie so compelling and so powerful, and that was Lincoln, of course, Steven Spielberg directing the biopic on President Abraham Lincoln, portrayed so brilliantly by Daniel Day-Lewis. But you got to work with Tommy Lee Jones. Was that in itself a kind of a masterclass? Tommy Lee Jones was as generous an actor as yes. I've ever worked yes. with. Well, you he played was... his character's housekeeper in that movie, didn't you? Yes who was really his lover. That's right. And that's why it was such an incredible piece. And I remembered going to see the movie and was sitting close to Steven, which, you know, I just remember being in this room when we were filming. It was me, Steven Spielberg and Tommy Lee Jones. And I kept saying to myself, this is real, this is real. You're not dreaming, you're, you're not dreaming. This is real. You're in a room and you're doing a film with Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. and, and Tommy Lee. And, and I remembered watching the film and, and thinking, wow, this is leading to me mm -hmm. because that character was, he was uh, uh, speaking against slavery. Yes. And, and it was just amazing to know, to see how it fit in the film. And just working with Tommy Lee was lovely. Um, he, I, I was amazed at how shy he is. I mean, he's painfully shy, but just really, really lovely and giving as, as, a, as an actor. Uh, and I remember that we finished filming and I came down the stairs in this big dress and all the cars, I think it was like the end of the day. So everybody was like, you know, getting out of there. And, and my, the, the van, I had missed the van. And, and he saw me and he said, come, come. And he op got out of the car. He opened the door for me, helped me in with my dress. I mean, just really a lovely guy. That, that was a great experience. It really was. Yes, you must be very proud because that was an incredibly powerful storyline that his Thaddeus Stevens uh, and, and your Lydia Hamilton Smith. I mean, that's back in a time and of a place uh, where that kind of stuff just, it didn't happen, you know? No, it, it did not. And, and I, you know, I think that when people see it, hopefully, you know, that's what they'll see that, that, you know, there are some love can, can override so many obstacles. Of course. And, and this man was, was very vocal and wanting to pass these bills so that black folks can be free. Yes. And then when he gets home, you see the reason why. Uh, you obviously talked about you and Tommy Lee Jones and Steven Spielberg being in that one room together. And for you is this kind of pinch yourself moment, you know. Yeah. What was Steven Spielberg like to work with? He was wonderful. I mean, you know, he, the, the, you know, we had done a, I actually done a, a, a reading, a sit down reading of, of the film, a, a, an iteration of the film, it changed quite a bit, but um, 
before earlier and at that time it was a uh, Liam Neeson who was doing playing Lincoln for the reading mm -hmm. so i would had the opportunity to meet him then and and he's really sort of loose and and you know it puts he'll put his hand on your shoulder you know he's really like that like you know very confident um and and in the in the room he you know he insisted that it just be the three of us in the rehearsal and then once we started shooting there weren't a lot of people in the room because it was a very intimate scene mm. uh and something between the these two people that meant the world for both of them and and he understood it and it was just really he was just so easy um and and you know that comes from most assuredly all the years of of experience he's had but also you know how to talk to people because there are some directors who've been doing it for years and they still don't know how to talk to a crew or to an actor but you know he, he's just it's so easy that I can't even think of another word other than easy that you know he confident in what he had in us and he was confident in what the story was about and and so you know let's let's do the scene it was just that simple it was that lovely and you've just brought up possibly another magic moment and that is right in in the beginning um Liam Neeson was to play Abraham Lincoln and there you are at a read with him I mean now that if surely he made your heart flutter a little a pather listen of course of course and just a really cool guy and yeah. you know just having those opportunities to be around you know that caliber of actor yes. it's really uh it, it's really quite heady when you're in that kind of company now for the past oh i don't know decade you've been um an advocate for diabetes and that's because i think you were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes a decade when I was, ago when i was 50 yeah, yeah that was two decades ago sorry about that i'm not turned, good with numbers I turned, but I turned 70 in november don't tell anybody i do not believe it. you're making that up don't tell anybody but no, no, yeah, I, won't. I i found out when i was 50 and it it took me a while to figure it out and, and i you know i realized that specifically in african-american households there's not a whole lot of conversation about diabetes and it's rampant in, in our community and so uh, this pharmaceutical asked me to work with them uh you know just literally going around to different cities and talking about my experience uh, because it's important that people know that they're not alone and it's important for people to know that it's not easy especially type 2 although it's getting younger and younger it's usually type 2 is considered adult onset mm -hmm. so you've already created all of your habits and habits are very very difficult to crack and and so what happens is you start blaming yourself and you can't you just have to figure out what you need to do to help you eat better to help you to get yourself out and exercise because all of those things make a difference so that you can live longer you know when i was diagnosed and i really started thinking about the people in my family who have diabetes you know my father died at 57 from complications my grandmother lost her sight i have an uncle who lost extremities oh. i have a brother who's diabetic and i started talking to my brother zephry and i was like you know we need to start having this dialogue because the term that was used was a touch of sugar. You know, Mama Pearl, my grandmother, Mama Pearl just has a touch of sugar. No, it's not a touch of sugar. It's diabetes. Mm. It's not a touch. It is that. And so, so for you, Patha, for those who don't know, what was the first sign that there was something wrong? Where did you begin to think, I don't know, I'm just feeling a little off or there's something happening here? Listen, I did not realize the symptoms until I went to the doctor. And what it was was frequent urination, lightheadedness. Sometimes I could walk the street and I would literally like sw sw swirl, sweat, 
swerve uh, because of this lightheadedness. Um, uh, those are, I think, the two main things. Uh, but, but certainly, uh, if you're going to the bathroom frequently, there is something that you need to do. A little fever. Sometimes I'd get a little fever. Uh, uh, you know, but those were the things that I found out. And once the doctor told me the list of things that could possibly happen, then I went, oh, check, check, check. And he said, yeah, that your plus your blood sugar is really high. I think by the time I was diagnosed, my blood sugar uh, level was at 350. That's really high. And for me, it should be anywhere between like 90 when I wake up in the morning and no higher than 150. If I have a glass of wine at dinner, you know, 160, 170, it shouldn't be any higher than that. So 300 is quite extraordinary. So, you know, it, it's important to me to share my experience so that people know that they're not alone. And if you if you fall, don't don't punish yourself just get back up mm -hmm. just get back up another little something about you maybe not a lot of people know uh is you are a great quilter um you quilt and you quilt magnificently and you've quilted for Lawrence Fishburne and his fabulous wife how did the quilting thing happen for you well that was years ago when I was in college and I was broke and I was working at this pizza joint and in the storage room, there was a sewing machine, an old Singer sewing machine. And my mother was a tailor, but as a kid, I never paid attention. And I remember her used to saying two things to me and I had to learn them as, as an adult to learn how to cook and learn how to sew. And I was like, eh, I'm gonna be an actor, I'm gonna be an actor. And so when, my first year in school, I realized I was broke. I, asked these the owners of this shop, could I use the machine? And they were like, you can have it. And it was a way for me to make gifts without spending a lot of money. Yes. And then I learned how to sew for myself. So then I started sewing clothes. And the very first quilt that I made was for Sam Jackson and Latanya Richardson's daughter, Zoe. <laughs> 30, I think Zoe is 35 now. And I visited them about five years ago, went into the house, the new house, Latanya showing me around the house. We get to Zoe's old room and there's the quilt. I, I was flabbergasted. That quilt is 35 years old. They still had it. I could see all the mistakes on it, but <laughs> I just loved that they kept it. And so working on Chicago Med, I'm working with a lot of young people who are getting married and starting families. And I, in the past eight years, I've probably made 10 quilts. Oh, good. Yeah. And I've got to say they're beautiful. You, you've shared some and I know we're looking at them now on the screen. How long does it take to, to make a quilt? I mean, it looks like at least months of work. Well, these are relatively easy in that they're applique. That's all done by machine. So if I'm if I have the time, I could probably make one of those in a month. But if I hand stitch, that's going to take me longer. Yes. Uh, so, but I just enjoy it because what what I love doing now is quilting and listening to books. Oh wait, yes, great combo. I love I love reading, but I have if I'm quilting, I'm I'm focused on that, and it took me a while to get used to it because I kept rewinding. Yes. But now I, I I love it. So I quilt, and I listen to books, and and it's a great way to relax. And you are still very very busy. You've just returned from Savannah, Georgia back to New York where you've been making uh, a movie there. Is there anything you can tell us about that or are your lips zipped on that one? Well, I can tell you this, it's a horror film. Oh, yes. 
And I'm, I had a blast. That's what I will tell you. I won't tell you if I'm the one who's afraid or the one who's fear, fearful of people oh, are feel, fearful God. of. I won't tell you that, but what a different genre and what fun. Is I this your to, first horror movie? Absolute first. And it's the director's first film. He yes. comes out of uh, uh, Colin Tilly. He comes out of... Uh, of uh, videos for for performers yes. and for singers and rappers and so this is his first film so between the two of us there was enough energy and excitement it was a, it was great i had a blast fantastic and then there's another project that i read has been executive produced by jada pinkett smith we grow now that you've just done Oh, oh, it, uh, yeah, that was last year with um, Journey Smollett. I had, that was lovely too. And yeah. it, it, you know, what I love about what's been happening the past few years is the opportunity to do other things uh, than, you know, playing those straight ahead characters that I do, like I did on Law and & Order and uh, now on Chicago Med, I get to play different types of characters. So uh, We Grown Now was was a, a, another lovely experience with uh, these two young men who I think are going to be great little actors. Um, and the one who played my, my grandson in particular, James Blake, really good uh, kid actors, just really lovely so yeah that was fun and that was shot in chicago so i didn't have to leave chicago when we wrapped uh for chicago med last season wow look i could i could chat with you all day and all night and then the next day and this could go <laughs> on forever but i know you've got a phone call to make right to yes. To Jesse, <laughs> right, and have a big catch up there. A paper. It is seriously a joy chatting to you. You could make any heart sing. You really well, could. Thank you, Craig. And I'll tell you, I so enjoyed the last time we spoke, and I was so happy when I got your email. And I'm still keeping my bucket list promise to you and coming to Australia. That's right. When last we chatted, we talked about that. You've never been to Australia, and we have to have. A sneaky little beer together, don't we? Wasn't that we the, a little well, pinky two. promise? That's what it was. Well, maybe two be sneaky beers, maybe two. Pinky oh, promise. okay. Well, look, as we're going to be indulgent about this, why don't we figure perhaps maybe three? Only okay, there you go. To be a hot we'll, day. Have, we'll have a lot to talk about. We certainly will. <laughs> Apatha, you are fabulous. You really are. Thank you so much, Craig. This has been lovely. <laughs>